Okay. All right, so I'm going to play something for you first, and then we'll go from there. now so I had a little bit of a <laughs> false start there and uh, and my dog who always gets his crunchies at five o'clock wasn't to be denied so we wouldn't have had a moment's peace if I hadn't taken care of that in the first place but nonetheless 
So we're talking about, um, well, a bunch of different topics. I decided uh, to expand on the the basic topic of just reharmonization and court substitution and all that. In the first place, that's a massive topic. And in the short time that we have, I wouldn't be able to get too far into that exclusively, but I am going to touch on some of those topics. And I'm also going to hopefully establish a couple of different starting points for those of you who haven't ventured too far into this style. Because it's a massive undertaking. It's something that I started many years ago and I work on all the time and I will be working on it for the rest of my born days. Um, but that said, it's really, it's, it's, it's a great way to be able to take everything that you know how to do on the instrument and put it all into one place and make music that is entirely self-sufficient. So I find that to be really sat a satisfying undertaking in the first place. Um, for me, the watershed moment in terms of realizing that there was something <laughs> that I needed to pay some attention to in terms of other information was when I heard a good piano player accompany a singer and he was basically reading the same parts that I had read the week before. And I noticed that he had a lot more in the way of harmony and harmonic variation and in terms of just the sort of arrangement that he was creating behind her using that part as his starting point. So that for me was that kind of aha moment where I thought to myself, all right, there's a bunch of other stuff that I don't know about here that I need to pay some attention to. And again, where to start? That's, that's a really a difficult question for a lot of players, especially beginning players that haven't dealt with the idea of doing melody and harmony at the same time. So some of the suggestions that I'm gonna to make to you today, hopefully will start you off on these little sort of pathways that will give you some new way of approaching undertaking this and uh, probably the first thing that you want to do is just begin with a tune that you love and it doesn't I just played a standard I played it had to be you um, but it doesn't have to be a standard it doesn't have to be a jazz classic it doesn't have to be something really harmonically complex or difficult it could be a popular song it could be a Beatles tune it could be anything but something that you love that you really um, want to be able to put some time into and get something in the way of a harmonized version of it going and um, and don't fall into the trap of thinking that you have to have harmony for every one of the notes in the melody. Um, that's the other part of this style that is, for me, a lot of fun. It's a little bit like writing in that, you know, especially if you're using a word processor, you have the, the capability to move stuff around and decide, oh, maybe not that, maybe this, so maybe I don't have to harmonize the pickup notes or whatever. For instance, I just did it had to be you. So... <laughs> I could have played in and harmonized the pickup notes, which I didn't do. Okay, so that's a choice that I kind of left out of that version that I just played of that. And um, again, when you watch experienced players play, you notice that there are they just have more choices, they have more options than you have, and it takes a while to develop that. Uh, but again, if you start with a tune that you love and take advantage of the fact that you have a lot at your disposal, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. A lot has been done with those tunes in the way of recorded versions and in the way of printed lead sheets. So one of the things I always tell my private students especially is uh, hunt up something in the way of several, if not many, as many lead sheets as you can find and just compare what is given to you to work with as far as basic harmony. Because assuming that you can find something that's a really accurate resource that will give you a place to at least begin with what the composer wrote. And I find that to be something that's really, you know, worth digging for. In a lot of fake book versions, uh, the harmony is less than ideal and it's less than complete and it's less than what exactly what the composer may have written. So that's something that you could do. Um, again, if you have, I have like many fake books that I can refer to and I have a bunch of them that I can access online or as PDFs. So that's a good starting point in terms of just putting together something in the way of like a basic plan in terms of how you're going to approach the thing harmonically. Um, let me look at my notes and make sure I'm staying kind of on my program here. Uh, the important thing is that you need to learn this by doing. Um, 
you, you need to study eventually and you need to pay attention to harmony, you need to pay attention to the theory behind all of these different concepts like flat five substitution and all the things that we talk about when we talk about reharmonization and chord substitution. But knowing about it is one thing and then having used it many times, having applied it many times is, is really the crucial issue. And that's what most people fall down on is the application of any of these basic concepts. Um, again, if you pick something that is widely known and that has been played a lot, has been recorded a lot, that gives you a lot to work with in terms of recordings. So that's another thing that I always suggest to my students is, you know, find recordings of people playing this and don't limit yourself to just guitarists. Um, some of the best stuff I've <laughs> stolen, some of the best ideas I've ever gotten came from piano players, um, organists, vibists, um, big band arrangements. So there's a huge resource that a lot of people don't discover until very late in the game that is unfortunate because when you look at big band arrangements, harmonically, they're usually way more sophisticated than what most guitar players and even piano players might play um, in terms of the kind of harmony that's being used, note for note. Um, plus, the ideas that are contained in those arrangements that are just detail-oriented as far as the arrangement itself offer you just this garden of delights as far as things to be able to try to copy or to use as an inspiration for something that you would do something a little bit different with. Um, but some of the best ideas that I've ever gotten have come from big band arrangements. So don't ignore that. Um, and then piano players. You know, there are so many good piano players that have um, small group arrangements that are very detailed and that give you a lot to investigate in terms of how they have crafted the arrangement. Um, Oscar Peterson comes to mind. So for a lot of his recordings, he recorded with bass and drums. In some cases, he recorded with bass and guitar, no drums. And those are great too. Um, but the detail in those arrangements in terms of what he used, how he started the tune, how he built up the tune, what he used for alternative harmony and all those things is just like, it's just a treasure trove of information. So if that's something you've never checked out, I highly recommend that you do that. Um, all right, so we talked a little bit about picking a standard that um, is something that's been recorded a lot. So here are a few kind of simple examples. Most people know the tune All the Things You Are, okay? The Jerome Kern is kind of a, it's a jazz standard. Mm -hmm. All right, so in the very beginning when you play the first part of the melody, and if I harmonize the melody F minor, the A flat on top, Okay, so at that point in the melody, I'm playing an E flat seven with a G on the top. That's the melody note, and it's a very well known and easily, you know, found voicing that we all know for E flat seven. So if I play, and then it lands on the A flat. Okay, so a simple substitution would be to play instead of the E flat seven. If I play. And then I used A7 in place of the E flat 7. That's a tritone substitute. Okay? So that's something that you'll hear experienced players do. That's something that you'll see in really good fake books like uh, Chuck Shear's New Real Book series. It's, a, it's just a level of detail that in some cases is included in a really good lead sheet. So, and I might maybe take that a step further. So I play F minor 7 to the B flat minor 7 with the D flat on the top. And then here again, instead of the E flat 7 and or the A7, I'm going to start with E minor 7, which is the 2 minor 7 chord that precedes the A7. So I'm just using a technique called back cycling. Okay? So now my, my chord melody will be this. So what I got was the E minor, and I can use that low E if I'm playing alone. And then I played this A9 voicing, A for free, as an open fifth string. And then I resolved to A flat major seven. Okay, so you can see the point I'm making. And you can find these substitutions being used in 
the many recordings of all the things you are by pianists and guitarists and horn players and all kinds of different people. Listen to the people playing in the rhythm section. That's a great place to be able to go to be able to steal ideas from people and get inspiration and learn something about it. And it's a different approach than just taking a book on reharmonization or chord substitution and studying from that. And that's important too. That's kind of the other side of the coin. But again, one of the uh, one of my favorite expressions is everything you need to know about playing is right there in your record collection. You just need to go get it out, right? And that's what's difficult for most people is just kind of finding a starting point. So this, for me, is like this is kind of an easy way to be able to approach that Herculean task in a way that at least makes it manageable from the word go. You're taking one tune, you're probably familiar with it already, and then you're seeing what is different about the harmony that these experienced players are using that is other than what you know about and figuring out what it is. And that might take some work and that's heavy lifting for your ear and for your whole, you know, your whole, every facet of your musicianship. But it's the good fight in terms of um, learning from the experience of listening to somebody else doing something in addition to what you're used to doing in those circumstances. So that's a good example. Um, the other jazz standard that comes to mind that's so widely played is Stella by Starlight. Um, and it starts off with, usually we jazz players play in B flat, right? So most most typically, it would be E minus seven flat five. Right? Now, if you, if you, were to listen to the original version of this song, and it comes from a film called The Uninvited. Um, the main character in the film is a composer, and he's writing a song for his love interest, and her name is Stella. And the, um, they do it in D in the film, but uh, the very first chord is not a minor seven flat five chord, it would be in B flat. It's a diminished seventh chord with a major seven on the top. So again, that's a harmonic realization a harmonic moment that when you hear it you know you're not hearing what you're used to hearing in terms of an e minus seven flat five but it's something that sounds great and obviously it was the original harmony that victor young wrote in the first place so so that again is a good example of some of the things that you can get from listening to the masters and from you know all the different people that have recorded this and it could be a, it might be a vocal version of it that might it might be something that the pianist or the guitarist or the big band that accompanies them is playing in the harmony that you can hear and that you like and that you have to dig for those are all battles that once you've won those battles you'll own that stuff forever and the experience of going through all that agony to get that by ear and by your wit of being able to find it on the fingerboard and then eventually making that connection with the theory behind it now you've completed that circuit and you will never lose that information that will become something that you can use time and time again on all of these different chord melodies that you create. So, you know, this is all inch by inch, very slow incremental progress that we're talking about. Let me go the rest of the way through here. So if I play on Stella, usually it goes to F. to the A-flat. E-half. Two. And then... harmony so far maybe another diminished chord now on this sequence usually it goes to right the D minus M five five and then C minus seven flat five, and then to F seven. Right, so that's a fairly typical cycle five kind of move, movement. Um, one of the substitutions that people use, and the first time I heard it used, it was used in 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 the one place where you play. Uh, and 
then instead of going to C minor seven flat five, you go to all right. So I played C minor nine eleven to harmonize the F sharp, and then to to all right. So that's interpolated harmony. That's harmony that doesn't exist that has been put in. It's another one of those techniques that is used widely in chord melody playing and in harmonizing melodies. And it's it's basically it's just a chromatic 2-5, right? So instead of landing on the C to F, you proceed it by C sharp to F sharp, and it creates interest. It crea And again, I, I say this a lot. It's not necessarily better than the original, but it's different, and it's an option. And it's something that you can choose to use some of the time or not use as your whim dictates, right? Here's the other place that typically typically gets kind of extended even further. So you might play, uh, and then you go for a chromatic 2-5 here, E flat minor 9, A flat 13, and then to the D half, and then to the G7, and then C sharp 2, and then 2, 2. All right, so that's a lot of information. That's pretty sophisticated harmony, but again, this is a tune that many of us know, and it's 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 an uber jazz classic, okay? So that's a good example of something that you could find many recordings of it to compare, and some of them may use that, some of them may use none of that at the end. But again, your ear becomes more and more and more sensitive to something that is other than what you expect in terms of harmony being used, and those are bright moments in terms of your ear's ability to then hear and recognize, right? And that's a crucial part of the process. The more you are involved in actually wrestling with this harmony and just trying to figure out what it is when you hear it and you know it appeals to you and you know it's something that's not something that you know about yet, that's really, that's very well worth pursuing because again, those experiences will stay with you for your lifetime. All right, so let me just check where I am. Time is, time is flying by here. Um, all right, let me just kind of look at my notes and decide what of the rest of the stuff that I said I was going to talk about, I want to include. One of the things that I make a big deal out of, especially with my students at USC, is if you're going to play something on a recording or in a recital, what's fun about this music for me is the option to put my own sort of individual stamp on it. And the easiest way to be able to do that is to create an arrangement, to do a treatment for a tune. So, you know, the more you can add to it in terms of detail that you come up with, and you might steal it from somebody else. God knows I've done plenty of that, and that's kind of the tradition of this music. But the idea that you would use your own kind of unique introduction rather than a stock introduction would be something to, to, to go for. So, that presumes that you know something about what stock introductions are. And I thought I might spend at least a few minutes kind of talking about some of that stuff. If say, say for instance, we're playing a tune, all right, so I just played something in E flat, right? So a stock introduction might be just some kind of a vamp on the five chord, some kind of a B flat seventh chord that's gonna sort of stay there until it eventually cadences or resolves to the one chord, and that's our introduction, okay? So I might play. I might use just a 5 7 chord or a 5 sus. I might make a 2 5. I might put a melody 2. All right, so that's a typical way that you might, in a, in a jam session or in a situation where you're playing with people that you haven't played before, start a tune and do something other than just start right on the beginning of the tune. So the more you know about all of the typical ways of starting tunes that are tried and true and that have been used to death, that's at least a starting point and you can use those on the tunes that you play and get comfortable with them and get tired of them and then start looking for something that represents way more involved kind of detail as far as, as creating an introduction. Um, the, the, the thing of starting a blues, instead of starting a blues on the, on the very beginning of the form, the top of the 12-bar form, you start from, say, for instance, we're playing, so blues in C. So you play the last four bars. Okay, so I use 
just the last four bars without a melody, and that's my introduction. So at least it creates something in the way of a kind of ramp, a ramp up into the tune. And again, detail-wise, for a recital or a recording or something that is a special performance, or at least for some of what you're going to do in any performance, it's cool to have arrangements. It's nice to have something in the way of your own personal take on how to play that tune. So, um, and there are a lot of, I'm not going to get to all of this stuff. Each one of these topics that I'm touching on is like a major several hour kind of deal. But just again, to sort of whet your appetite, um, you might do something in the way of like, so say we're in C, I start. Okay, so what I did was I played a two chord, two minor seven, D minor seven, and then I went up a minor, minor third. And then I start my tune on the one chord. Okay, all of these so far um, would be really typical, especially for tunes that begin on the one chord. Um, other details that you might put into your arrangements: an interlude. Okay, think of like um, Night in Tunisia has that um, that interlude that happens between solos. That's kind of a cool detail that you could do on any tune. You just have to come up with the interlude. You have to create that. You have to write that. You have to conceptualize that, right? That's another way to, um, to add interest to your arrangement. Um, what, about, what about a shout chorus, right? Um, one of the, probably the most famous shout chorus that I can name comes originally from Count Basie's Splanky, S-P-L-A-N-K-Y. If you've never heard this, Check it out, the Count Basie band. <laughs> it's just, it's a great recording. Um, if you've never checked it out, but so Splanky. And to underline how appealing that is, Wes Montgomery actually appropriated, let's call it, the shout chorus from Splanky in a different key. Splanky's in D flat. So Wes Montgomery played basically the first eight bars of the shout chorus from Splanky in the key of G in his. Uh, <laughs> The, the tune is called The Thumb. Right, it's a blues and G. So if you listen to that recording, when, when he gets the solo built up to the point where it really feels like it needs to kind of like, you know, reach a climax, then he plays this shout chorus, which is... finish it I'm gonna hopefully inspire you to go and find those two recordings Count Basie's Splanky and uh, West Montgomery's The Thumb and check them out and listen to what um, happens in the last four bars on the Basie recording and then what West Montgomery does which is a lot more challenging for guitar players in the last four bars okay and again because of the fact that we're <laughs> limited as far as time here I'm not gonna have time to go into these things but I'm giving you something to kind of follow through with when, when, we, when we're done here. Um, I have this one quote that I want to read. So a shout chorus. Uh, the definition, all right, it's a composed chorus played after solos and before the head out. It was defined in the April 2009 issue of Guitar Player Magazine this way. Lively and climactic, sometimes bombastic, full of accented notes and often focused around a repeating riff, riff possibly even a riff from a different song, a shout chorus is that energized vamp section in a big band or other ensemble arrangements that intensifies the groove and gets feet a tapping and hips a swaying. <laughs> I thought that was particularly uh, well worded. So, um, shout choruses. Um, let's see, what else? Some tunes have classic introductions or endings. You would want to know those. Uh, Satin Doll, Take the A-Train, All the Things You Are has something called the Bird of Paradise intro or ending, right? So these are, again, are all details. Um, what about a tag? If you don't know what a tag is, there are different ways of tagging the last, you might, for instance, take the last four bars of a song and just repeat it once more or twice more. You might tag just the first two of the last four bars. Again, these are topic areas that I could go on for... <laughs> 
quite a long time about and demonstrate in detail, but we're just sort of touching on some topics that may turn into be new content that I'll eventually find my way to get around to doing. But um, these are all things that, again, give you something to work with in terms of taking the tunes that you play and adding to them and making them more detailed and making them so that you have more and more in the way of your own creative input that you've put into them. And that for me is like, that's what keeps me interested in this. There's always something else that you can do with these tunes in terms of play them at a different tempo, play them in a different key, play them in a different genre, play them in a different arrangement or treatment. There's always something, some way to breathe new life into these tunes. And, and then again, there are a million great tunes to deal with. So you'll never run out of material. All right, so we're getting to be at about 540 and I'm thinking, so I've, I started about 10 minutes late. So if I go too much longer, we're not gonna have too much time for anything in the way of questions. So let me just kind of scan down my list here and see if there's anything. All right, so sounds great. Looking forward to hearing that. All right, so if you have a question, Feel free to type it in for me at this point, because that's what I'm looking at now. I'm just so far hearing, seeing a bunch of nice comments, but <laughs> nothing in the way of a question. So the original plan was to do 30 minutes of basically kind of speaking, teaching, and then 30 minutes of question and answer. So you may have something that you're working on in terms of a particular tune that you have a question on or that you want me to talk about or maybe demonstrate something. Hopefully it would be something that I would know. Um, but in any case, I'm just going to see what I find here and not leave too much dead air. All right, so until I see something in the way of uh, an actual question or something that needs some kind of a response, wow, there's somebody from, from Portugal. <laughs> All right, so I'll demonstrate something else from one of my recordings here. The last record that I did was a, a, a tribute to Joe Pass. It's called For Joe. And um, so one of the tunes I did on it, Cole Porter's uh, Love Is Here to Stay. So again, when you look at lead sheets, first of all, a lot of people know that as our love is here to stay. And the actual title of the tune is love is here to stay. So if you look in that fake book under O, you'll never find it. Um, but there are a fair amount of lead sheets that I've seen that are available for this. And again, you know, the harmony tends to be hopefully in the best case scenario, what the composer originally wrote and no more. Um, the new real book series, as I said earlier, does very often include something in the way of uh, alternative harmony. And it might be just what has become common practice to substitute for the original harmony. It might be something that, um, say for instance, like in certain cases they put, well, here's what Bill Evans uses for this part of the tune. They put some kind of hip harmony that he came up with. That's a different, a different whole way to harmonize that section of the tune and things like that. So the really good fake books will include that information, but the um, the vast majority of them just give you the basic changes. So, right, so here I'm in the key of E flat. And it usually starts on some kind of like an F7 chord. So I'm playing. Right, so now it lands on E flat, two, three, four, one, two, and I could leave it there for two bars if I just go according to the original harmony, okay? But again, in terms of reharmonization and substitution, I might find my way to the F7 again by going. All right, so what I did was I made the chord progression, then moved to A flat seven. So it's like four, seven, Lydian. And then, I can think of this as either G minor or like an E flat chord over the third. And then a C7 to take me to the F7 again. Now again, so there I went. I'm putting in that B chord. I could just go. All right. 
And the only difference is I get the root motion that now goes. Moves from the F, up a tritone to the B, down in a half step to the F. It's not better than the original F minor to B flat. It's just different. It's an option, right? So that's what I want to kind of clue you into as far as what you'll be looking for when you listen to other people's recordings of these tunes is be listening for things like that where stuff is happening with the harmony that is in addition to what you're used to and see if you can figure out what it is because once you get a claw hold, a little grasp on it, you're going to be really, you'll be hooked. It's like it's such a fun um, activity. I have a couple of questions here now. Let's see. All right, so the first one that I saw had to do with when I'm transcribing Oscar Peterson, do you take it to the piano first to see how it sounds? No, I'm not. My piano chops, what few chops I had when I left my undergraduate at Berkeley have long since gone away from, from underuse. So I, I barely can function at the keyboard anymore, and I'm just so used to doing it on piano. But what happens is um, one of the big problems with transcribing from piano is like you can't play those voicings in a lot of cases. You have to kind of you have to leave some stuff out. You can't play everything. You know, piano players have 10 fingers and they have the breaks and all that stuff that we don't have as far as like capability to really get dense harmonies. But it's really a good challenge for your ear to be able to figure out what the essence of that harmony is and then come as close to it with a voicing on the guitar that makes you feel as though you at least have the basic chord sound and the, the essential color that you're hearing happening. If you can get there, then that to me is like, that's almost as good as, as, as you know, exactly the same thing on a, on a keyboard. And, you know, again, you're going to have to transfer to the guitar anyway. So sooner or later, you're going to have to lose a few notes. But that's a good question. Um, all right. So uh, let's see. There was another one. I haven't done any transcribing yet. Software. Um, if you don't have any, well, first of all, most software allows you to uh, slow down the tempo and, and mess with the pitch and all that stuff. But I don't know if you're aware that YouTube has a pretty kind of cool feature. There's like a little cog or it looks like a gear. And when you click on it, it allows you to play the selection that you're seeing the video at either half speed or a quarter speed or 75%. So at least there are those four increments that you can slow the stuff down. And that's actually a really <laughs> very useful tool that somebody pointed out to me not all that long ago that will give you at least a starting point if you don't want to go out and, and buy software. I, I've used uh, Amazing Slow Downer, and that's very good. There was a free one um, uh, that I won't be able to think of the name of, but um, the last one that I actually bought and that I use now is called Transcribe, and it's very good. Um, so I would recommend that. Um, in a few more can you outline the steps you do in order to create a new melody yeah um, I mean this again when you're starting out it's a little bit like throwing somebody into the deep end of the pool to say okay here's the here's the tune and here's the melody and just here's the harmony go it's it's a tall order there's a lot to do there but if you can at least get something in the way of again the basic changes and harmonize a few key points in the melody that you think warrant having harmony to support that note, okay? And and making those judgments and making those calls is very difficult in the beginning. But eventually, you'll start to develop something in the way of a sensibility, and it will come from a combination of trial and error, and from a combination of, and this is really important, if you record it and listen to it, you'll get a good sense of what it sounds like to a listener who is not operating the instrument. I find that point of view to be absolutely essential. And if it's not something you're doing a whole lot of, you should definitely start doing a whole lot of it. Recording yourself and listening to yourself is the single best way to, first of all, make yourself depressed. <laughs> but you need to get past that, get over yourself, and just get good at being able to make judgments about what you're happy with and what you're not happy with that needs to be changed and move on. You know, Don't join the ISOC club. Don't sit there and, and get depressed about stuff. Just learn from it and move on. It's the single best way to figure out what's going on that is right and what's going on that needs some kind of attention or some kind of change, okay? But you basically, like I said, get going with, like if I went, right? So if I didn't harmonize anything else, I'd want to harmonize that E flat, right? Now if I harmonize it with this, so it's an F7, there's an E flat, 
all right, it's not the greatest voicing in the world. It's pretty bland. There's no color in it. But if what I did play was, right? So that at least has a ninth in it instead of that double root, right? So I might go, and then, all right, so that's just a drop two inversion. And then I could play. All right, so now, again, I've kind of gotten a little bit more advanced there, but if I go, so that's a voicing that will at least get me that F7 sound, and then, all right, so, again, when I hit the E flat, I played, notice the places that I applied the harmony. And then a B flat. So then on the downbeat, I play an E flat six chord. Now that is a diminished seventh chord that you may recognize. And how it's functioning is C7 flat nine. And then I get to. Now again, I could play and play the whole thing at once, or I can play. And again, I have some inside motion here and some pretty advanced things happening, but hopefully this has given you some insight into how you go through this process. Just get a very basic version of it where you've chosen a few essential notes to add harmony to and start from there and get good at being able to play it at least at a, a slow tempo then record it, then listen to it, and then go, all right, well, it, would, it might be nice if I had, um, and then here, I don't have anything on the bottom of that to really give me anything. I could put the C, and that's kind of hard to play, but check this out. Instead of thinking F7, if I back cycle to its 2 minor 7, which is C minor 7, then I get... Now, again, I have interpolated harmony. I have added harmony. I have had to think of the process, the device of back cycling. Okay? So instead of playing this F7, F9, I played. So now I have a lot going on here. I played the C minor 7, and then it goes to the F7, and then I have that little line that goes from the 13. And then I played a little B flat sus, and then I'll play. Again, I played B flat sus, and then this is a diminished seventh chord again that you might recognize. All it is is functioning as a B flat seven flat nine, which is a little bit more color, pulls a little bit harder towards the one chord. And so forth. So hopefully that gives you some insight in the short time that we have here as far as a way to approach it. Don't go for everything you can think of as you go along, go for a really simple, basic, just harmonize key notes, listen to it, evaluate, add, listen to some recordings, look at some lead sheets, get some new ideas, add, and before you know it, you'll have a version of it going that is pretty detailed compared to the way that you started out. And that's how this process works. It's like there's no way to just impart all the knowledge that's necessary to do a really in, incredibly detailed chord melody from the word go. You have to start simple. And, um, and simple is good. You know, it doesn't have to be mucked up with every possible harmonic option for it to be good, right? If you play it simply and well and in time, that's good. That's a good beginning, right? Don't worry about making it so incredibly complex from the word go. Let me see what else I have. I've done my arrangements, drop two shell voices. And I'm starting to feel stale with these options, huh? All right, well, you know, I still, I know what you're saying as far as, all right, so I have a question. He's done his arrangements of drop two, drop three, shell voicings, third and seventh, root, melody, starting to feel stale with these options. Um, I haven't experienced that yet. <laughs> and, and I've been doing this for a long time, but there's like, I mean, the combination of what you're describing is, if you have all that stuff down, good for you, Vincent. Um, but what I would say is the next frontier for you would be, I would study harmony. I would get into um, studying chord substitution and reharmonization and, and interpol uh, har interpolating harmony. That will give you a whole bunch of different options that will 
give your arrangements a lot more in the way of flesh and a lot more in the way of new substance, right? Because I agree, you know, that you can, it's really pretty easy to kind of burn out on just making use of those, those voicings. But the next frontier um, I'm going to go out and say would be get into some harmony, maybe get with somebody who really knows their way around harmony, could even be a piano player. I mean, if you study with a good piano player, you can get tons of great ideas in terms of how to reharmonize tunes, and that might be a really good way to sort of, sort of get out of the rut that you're in. Um, somebody asked, have I gone through George Van Epp's harmonized triads? Um, <laughs> well, I, I own those books, and uh, and I actually had the good fortune to meet George, and, and I played with him once. And I didn't play that much because I had such a good seat next to him. I basically just kind of watched what he was doing and just delighted in the fact that I was sitting so close to him. Um, but he was a great guy. And, and when I, the first time I met him, he had something where he was fussing with his glasses and mentioned that the reason that he was wearing glasses was because he had basically lost his eyesight or made his eyesight poor writing all of those books. Um, those are a great study. And if you have the time, and the inclination, you can learn a lot from doing all that. I mean, that's just another one of those things on my to-do list uh, for the, that could take me for the rest of my life is to go through all that material, that great stuff that he wrote. Those, there's tons of great, great substance there that you could dig into. Um, all right, let's see. All right, until I see... All right, so I'm going to continue on a little bit with a few minutes that we have just kind of going through some of the other things that I've done with uh, Love Is Here To Stay. So I played. Now again, I'm, I'm using bass notes. All right, so that E comes up to F and I get this kind of nice sort of contrary motion. If I'm playing solo, then those are concerns for me. If I'm playing with a rhythm section, I'm going to stay out of the bass player's real estate and let him decide on what the bass notes are, okay? Um, and that's a whole other set of concerns in terms of interacting with other players and being able to listen to the other players and react to the other players um, in, in a dialogue. Because, again, this music, when you play it with other people, can be very much we all operate in our own silos, separate silos, independent of what each other is doing. But that's not fun. Okay, think of a good conversation. In a good conversation, there's an exchange, there's a dialogue. I say something, you react to it, you disagree, you agree, you say something else, somebody makes a joke, somebody, and there's an exchange, and we have a good time with it, right? It's fun, we're playing, we're at play. So, in the same way, when you're playing with people and they do something that is a little out of the ordinary or unexpected or cool or a different option than what you're used to, it's good to be able to. First of all, be aware of that, right? Hear it, and then react to it. And this is a whole other level of accomplishment in terms of playing with other people. That, um, you know, that, again, yet another topic that I could talk for another three hours about. Um, but here, I'm, I'm functioning as a solo guitarist, so I'm, I'm kind of adding my own bass notes as I go along. That's where I kind of get off onto that rabbit trail. So, so again, I'm playing F my F7 2. I'm playing an A flat as a passing chord to to a G chord. So it's just a a, a dominant seventh chord that resolves down a half step, right? Like a flat five substitute. So This is A minor 7 Now, this sequence usually is so G minor 7, C7, F minor 7, B flat 7. D minor 7 flat 5, and we head towards C minor, G7. Alright, so the harmony for that whole section for On the C minor seven, right? I'm a little bit out of tune. Hold on just a second. Okay. All right, so here's a cool thing that, that I heard somebody do and that I used in my arrangement of it. So if you 
If you hear my recording of it, you'll hear this. So instead of F, uh, G minor 7, C7, these are all for two beats. G minor 7, C7, F minor 7, E flat 7, E flat for a whole bar, and then D minor 7 flat 5 to G7 to the C minor 7. Okay? It's a cool thing that, that you can do with that. And it works with the melody, which is like, all right, so this is like hitting the lottery times 10. So you, you can play, instead of starting on G minor, I'm going to start on a half step above. All right, so I'm using the principle of, again, this is another arranging, uh, re I mean, uh, what do you call it? Yeah, reharm concept called half step two fives. So it's going to be, right? So you can hear what I'm doing. It's like A flat to D flat, and then G to C, and so forth. Right? And I'm going to use that sequence to harmonize that whole sequence that usually would just be. So here we go. Okay. So I mean, again, that's a good example of that's an awful lot of harmony, and it's a lot of you know choreography as far as your your left hand is concerned. But it's something to do on that tune that's unusual and that's cool and to be able to get away with all that half step chromatic two five stuff is you know for me that was like i just thought wow i, I gotta use this i gotta uh, let's see i'm looking through and see if i have any other good questions and All right, um, maybe one last example. On the record I did before, the For Joe record, I did a, a, an organ record, and I, I did a tune that was made famous by uh, Fats Domino in the 60s called I'm Walking. And in terms of an arrangement, and again, you know, this is <laughs> sort of self-serving in that hopefully you'll go and buy this recording and, and, and check this out, but what came to me as an idea as I was thinking about doing I'm walking because I sang this on the record actually but um I started thinking about just the idea of like what other what other tunes did I do I know that use the the word walking walking in any way so there's that um the Miles Davis it's called walking okay and uh Okay, so it's a pretty well-known blues thing that Miles Davis recorded and made famous. So I thought, all right, well, so the whole idea of using that um, came to me as far as, all right, well, I could use that as an introduction and then go into the Fats Domino tune. So that would be one way of sort of tying in the whole thing of like, all right. And I mean, again, these are details that maybe no one... Well, I've had a few people mention to me, hey, isn't that the walking introduction from Miles Davis? So somebody has noticed it. I'm not going to say everybody that listens to this tune goes, hey, Miles Davis is walking. But again, the idea that it's something that I did with my treatment of the Fats Domino tune, that's just a little different. And then later on in the tune, I used a shout chorus. Okay. And the shout chorus comes from... It's called Blues Walk, okay? So, again, there's that little walking theme that just sort of kind of laces its way through the tune, and it, it's a level of detail that, for me, showed a little bit more imagination, a little bit more of my own kind of creative sort of whim, and, and it allowed me to kind of let my imagination run wild a little bit with, all right, well, how can I tie this in? How can I get in and out of that or whatever? And, and it, again, it's a level of detail that a lot of treatments of some of these tunes don't have. So 
you know, it's something that I try to interest people in because it's it's so much fun to kind of try to take all these different elements and kind of find a way to combine them in a way that nobody has ever done before. And it's your own unique treatment of the tune. Um, see what else I might have missed. All right. Um. <laughs> all right, here's a couple of requests that I'll choose to ignore. <laughs> All right. All right. So, I think I pretty much touched on everything that I've seen in terms of a a question. Let me just run down the list here once more. Yeah. All right, well, uh, you can find me on TrueFire, and I have content there that uh, if you're interested in more of what I do, and hopefully I'll be doing some new stuff for them somewhere in the coming year. But uh, this has been fun. And thank you for tuning in.